Thank you very much. And thanks for joining me. I know there's ice cream out there, so I appreciate you giving that up to be in here with me. So thank you. Um, yeah, as, as has been said, I'm a developer advocate at IBM. Um, I'm from the UK originally, uh, and previously to working as a developer advocate, I did a biology degree. Fish and Java, they totally go together, right? Um, so yeah, I've kind of transitioned into the world of tech, looking at Java, looking at all things open source um, and cloud native. So today I'm going to be giving, I've got a talk now, I've also got a talk this afternoon on observability. So come say hi in Hall A if you want to come to that later today. Um, but this talk today, this morning, is all about the next frontier in open source Java compilers, looking at whether we can utilize JIT in time compilation as its own service external to the JVM and what performance benefits that might bring. So without further ado, I'm going to get started. Um, this is mostly sort of slides today, but there's also a demo in there as well just to showcase how this all works in an application. So we're going to be breaking this down into three segments today. We've got the actual problem. So why are we even considering this? Why do we care about this subject? And why are we suggesting to remove your JIT? Um, the reason behind that, so the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever you want to call it, behind JVMs and JIT compilations when it comes to the cloud. And then our solution, which is introducing that as its own microservice. So starting off with the reasons. My click is broken. I'll just leave that. So starting off with the reasons is, you know, is Java a good fit for the cloud? We've all got Java applications that many of our enterprise applications run on, and they're running mission critical applications to our business. And we want to be able to utilize that cloud innovation, that cloud infrastructure for our applications. But is it actually a good fit? For contrast, let's start with how we would typically run our Java enterprise apps. Normally, we'd have some kind of monolithic application, often running on a dedicated server. And to make sure we didn't have any performance issues, we'd load that server up with plenty of CPUs and memories. And of course, that application ran really well. Well done, us. Because it didn't really matter that it took 10 minutes to start up, because it never went down. We never really brought that application down. We didn't really have a need to. So maybe once every six months, it would be taken offline to launch a new version of some kind. Maybe we'd have some library upgrades, a couple of new features, maybe some bug fixes. But that was pretty much the only time we brought it down. And it all worked really well. However, as we start fast forwarding to today and we look at this trend to deploy apps to the cloud, we start looking at a different way that we need to be architecturing our applications and the different infrastructure we're now running on. So now that same monolithic application is now often composed of many small microservices that all have to talk to each other, all running in containers. Many of them will be managed by some kind of cloud provider, whether that's Kubernetes, for example. And then we also have to think about auto-scaling, being able to scale dynamically up and down depending on the load and the demand to our system. So it gets a little bit more complex. Now, the reason that we're actually aiming for this complexity, ironically, is because of these motivators. This is the reason that we want to be able to move our applications to the cloud. Things like being able to have greater agility and the dynamic nature that that cloud provides, easier rollout when it comes to frequently releasing new releases of our applications much more easily and frequently, and it gives us that positioning to be able to take advantage of the latest innovations. You might not think of IT as a fashion industry, but it kind of is when you think about it, because we're constantly trying to follow the latest fashions and trends. You know, we're trying on whatever it is, the new dress, uh, when it comes to Java and cloud infrastructure. So really, this is what it enables us to do. It also enables us to have less infrastructure to maintain and manage, because we're not having to take care of that dedicated server anymore. And of course, a major motivator, because at the end of the day, most of us are businesses. And what do businesses want to do? Make money. So when it comes to making money, we also want to save money to be able to have those greater profits. So saving money is a great motivator when it comes to the cloud. But how do we ensure that performance is still acceptable to our customers while still minimizing our costs so that we actually do save money whilst not basically really annoying our customers at the same time? So how do we achieve this balance between performance and cost? And this is kind of the golden question when it comes to developing for cloud native infrastructure. These are the two main variables, I would say, when it comes to sort of 
d designing and developing our applications to try and strike this delicate balance between cost and performance. Now, we've got two main variables, and that's container size and container instances, which is often how we can control these two variables, cost and performance. Container size, we can control. We can determine how big that container is going to be. But scaling instances is often left to the cloud orchestrator to be able to manage. But we can do a lot to be able to ensure that scaling is efficient and effective. And we'll get onto that a bit more later. What this graph really shows is that there are various ways that we can get these variables wrong. And there is only a very small subsection on the right-hand side where we get that Goldilocks just right situation where we're getting that perfect balance. And actually, this can be quite hard to do. Of course, if we under-provision our containers and not enough instances can be effectively run, we save on money, but our performance is just essentially unacceptable. Our customers are not going to be using our applications. That's that bottom left-hand corner. Now, we might have containers that are too big, or we might have too many instances, so we're over-provisioning here. Um, and what that means is we might have great performance, but we're wasting a lot of money. On the other hand, um, we might, for example, have containers that are too big and too many instances. Again, it's, it's kind of that balance, trying to get the balance between cost and performance, and we're trying to get these right size, just enough instances. But this can be quite difficult. So to understand why this is so hard, it's important that we go over some background information on how Java applications actually execute, because that's going to affect these factors directly. So turning our attention to the JVM and JIT compilers. Uh, so you guys are at a Java conference. So I'm kind of assuming you have a basic understanding of JVMs. However, I do understand that sometimes students can come to these conferences. So just so I know whether I can skip these slides, is anyone unfamiliar with how the JVM is architected or how it works? Yeah, a couple of hands. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Perfect. Thank you for raising your hands. OK. Just as well, I had these slides. There we go. Um, so I have these just in case, because I like to make sure we're all on the same playing field here. So when it comes to the JVM, this is really one of the reasons that Java is so popular as a language for enterprise applications today, because it's platform independent, and it's this write once, run anywhere mentality, the ability to be able to just write your application and know that it will run anywhere there, there is a JVM running. This portability is really enabled by the JVM. We love acronyms in tech. Honestly, it's like speaking Latin half the time. But JVM stands for Java Virtual Machine. If I don't explain an acronym that I use throughout this, just raise your hand, and I'll go over it again. I sometimes forget. Just let me know. So that's the JVM. How does it work? Well, essentially, what we're doing here is, first of all, we're compiling our Java code into bytecode. We then pass it to the JVM for execution. So at a very high level, the JVM is essentially loading and verifying the bytecode. And then it passes it to an interpreter, which is that red box there, um, to execute one byte at a time. Um, and this interpreting is where it gets a little bit slow. Um, so it can take a bit of time to actually do this interpretation, and that can affect performance. However, the great benefit we gain from this is that portability um, and interdependence. So to help with this, because this can be quite a slow process at times, we have something called JIT. Um, and that stands for just-in-time. So this is a just-in-time compiler that basically helps with that performance issue. Uh, so you can see it, it's highlighted here on the right-hand side here. Um, this essentially converts Java bytecode into machine code, which is optimized. So typically, the typical unit of compilation is a method. But to save resources, it only compiles hot methods. So that means methods that are basically repeatedly called, ones that we call it a lot very often. Um, and another benefit of this is that essentially any code that we generate using the JIT is stored in a code cache, so it's available for the lifetime of the JVM. So it can help us to really optimize on having to re-interpret um, sort of the same methods that lots of our microservices could be using again and again and again. Um, so it really can help save on performance and time. Um, the JIT converter, it can execute 10 times faster than the interpreter. Um, so it really is a helpful sort of addition to our JVM. Those who put your hands up. Good? Fab, got thumbs up. Fantastic, cool. So now that we've got basic understanding of the JVM and the JIT, let's go into the good and the bad and why we might consider taking out this JIT from our JVM and having it as a separate service. So the good. This is really, as I said, one of the main reasons Java took off early on was because it was device independent. We have this write once, run anywhere mentality. It's been around for a long time. And it's been constantly improving over that time. 
I remember coming into this job. I got thrown into the world of Java. My first day at work, everyone was like, welcome. So Java. And I was like, sorry, what is Java? And everyone looked at me like, whoa, beginner, beginner. Um, I found out that Java is actually older than I am. And that can be a little intimidating at time. But what it actually gives us is a history of innovation that allows us to continually innovate and improve that over time with the support of the community. And that's really what has enabled it to continue to be such a force when it comes to creating enterprise applications. And of course, I've mentioned about the JIT. The fact that we have the JVM and the JIT to be able to produce optimized machine code through the use of profilers. So over time, what a profiler allows us to do is to basically work out uh, more and more of these hot methods that can be compiled to be able to optimize our application. Um, so that can be a really great benefit. Um, and we also have, within Java, a great garbage collection. Um, and as I said, the longer it runs, the better it runs, as the JVM collects more profile data and the JIT compiles more methods. So it really can be a very effective uh, language to be using for our applications, and the JVM really helps with that. However, and this is where we lead into my talk, the bad. Obviously, there are always trade-offs when it comes to using any tool, any language for our applications. So here are some of the trade-offs of the JVM and Java. So the initial execution run is interpreted because the JIT server hasn't really started compiling those hot methods. And that can mean that it is relatively slow because interpretation takes time. Hotspot methods compiled by the JVM can create CPU and memory spikes. And we'll go into why that can be a problem in the cloud in a minute. CPU spikes can then cause a lower quality of service. Memory spikes can cause potential out of, uh, out of memory exceptions. And that, in the worst case scenario, can result in crashes to our applications, which is a complete failure. Um, and of course, also things like both CPU and memory spikes can slow down startup time and ramp up time. What I mean by startup time, this is the time it takes for our app to be ready to process its first request whereas ramp up time is the time it takes for JIT to compile all of the hot methods and for us to be running fully optimized. So there's a little bit of a differentiation there between startup and ramp up. So what this really looks like, and the reason that it's kind of bad for the cloud, is when we take a look at graphs like this, uh, so this is a day, tra day trader seven application. Uh, this is kind of representative of an enterprise application. You can find it on GitHub. Uh, if you're interested, I can send you the link to it. It's sort of a generic application that we use to demonstrate performance. So here we have a typical Java app at startup. And what you can see on the left-hand side, this is CPU utilization, and this is memory utilization. And those red arrows that I very helpfully pointed out for you here um, are essentially the spikes that we have in CPU and memory. So what you can see is that CPU spikes on the left and the memory spikes on the right. A lot of the CPU spikes are caused by JIT compilations. And you can see that the biggest spikes occur at the start when the JIT is most active trying to compile those hot methods that it's identified. The result of these can be a lower quality of service, like I mentioned, which basically means you've got sluggish performance. This is also true for memory spikes, as you can see on the, your right-hand side here. Um, so you can see the biggest spikes are related to JIT compiles during ramp up. So memory spikes are particularly bad because, again, as I said, they can cause out of memory issues, including potentially crashing the JVM. Now, what we're trying to do, really, is to find the sweet spot. It's easier said than done because, actually, it can be quite hard. Um, but now that we have some background info on the JVM, the JIT server, what we're trying to do in the cloud in terms of optimizing those variables, um, how do we go about actually enabling this sweet spot, finding the right size provisions containers and well-behaved efficient auto-scaling. So we're going to take a look at our two variables. So for container size, remember that back to that graph that I showed you with container size and number of instances. So our main issues here when it comes to Java is that we need to over-provision in order to avoid out-of-memory issues. So we need to be able to handle those initial spikes but once those initial spikes are over, those resources are wasted once the app reaches a steady state. Um, so it can be very hard, especially because Java is non-deterministic. What that really means is that if you run the application twice, what you'll get is two completely different profiles, two different spike levels happening at different times. So it really doesn't help us because we can't predict when those are going to happen or how high they're going to be. So even if you run a series of different load tests, you, you're not even getting that close to what might be right for your application. So that can be a big issue with container size. When it comes to auto-scaling, some of our biggest issues are the fact that we've got this slow startup and ramp-up times. 
and that makes scaling ineffective. New instances can take far too long to be able to start up, causing those quality of service issues. The alternative is just to start more instances than you ever think you'll need. But kind of, that's kind of really eliminating auto-scaling. At that point, you've just got loads of services that you're just either not using or using. So another problem is that CPU spikes due to JIT compiles can cause issues with auto-scalers. Um, these spikes can be interpreted incorrectly. So it could see those spikes as potentially being what your application needs, when really it's just your JIT compiler starting up. Um, so those aren't necessarily what you need. And what that means is that you might set your thresholds very high, but again, it's not really effective auto-scaling because that's not really what your application needs. So these are the issues that we're trying to tackle. And this is something that really many different organizations have been trying to tackle for a long time. So the solution here, if we just look at the theory, is to minimize and eliminate those CPU and memory spikes and improve startup and ramp up times. And this is where we can consider something like JIT as a server as a potential solution to help solve these problems. Uh, so this leads us to JIT as a service, to the rescue. Yay. So what do I mean as JIT as a service? So the basic premise here is that we're essentially decoupling the JIT compiler from the JVM and letting it run as a completely independent process. So you can see here on the left-hand side, we have our Docker containers with a JVM in each. And then we've actually got separate remote JITs that we're utilizing for that JIT compilation. Just a note here on this diagram, we have crossed out the JIT in the JVM. We have not removed it. It's still there. What we do is we override it and tell the JVM to send all compilations to the remote JIT. However, the nice thing is, because we've left the JIT in the JVM, if that remote service goes down, we can automatically use the local JIT. So it's not a problem. It's basically a backup. So note, with that cross, it doesn't mean it's gotten rid of. It just means we're not using it right now. So here we have a couple of JVMs. The JVMs will no longer use their local JIT and will offload their remote to the remote JITs that we show here. Those will be containerized and made available as a cloud service, as you can see on the right-hand side here. What this gives us is the added benefit of being able to manage by orchestrators like Kubernetes. So we can make sure that our service is always running, that it scales properly to be able to handle demand. Um, and this solution is essentially just like any other monolith, where you're using things like the strangler pattern to be able to strangle out different microservices from that original monolith, except what we're doing here is just strangling out the JIT from the JVM as a microservice. So this kind of originates, this service does exist. Um, it's available, and it's open source, which is great. Yay, everyone can use it. Um, so it actually exists uh, as, and it's called JIT Server, uh, and it's a feature of the Eclipse OpenJ9 JVM, which is totally open source and free to download. You can go check it out on GitHub if you would like to see it in more detail if you've not tried it before. Um, another name that we call it at IBM is Semaru Cloud Compiler, because we distribute it with IBM Semaru Runtimes, which I will talk about in a minute. Uh, but for distribution, the OpenJ9 basically combines the OpenJDK binaries to be able to form a full JDK. Um, and as I mentioned, the Eclipse OpenJ9 JVM, and by extension, JIT server is completely open source. So a little bit of background on OpenJ9. Who's come across OpenJ9 before? A few hands. OK, not so many. OK, great. Then I've got an intro. Welcome to OpenJ9. Um, so this, is, uh, this originally started life as the J9 JVM, which was originally developed by IBM about 20 years ago. And it basically ran all of our Java workloads on IBM hardware. It was then open sourced to the Eclipse Foundation five years ago and then rebranded as OpenJ9. It works with any Java workload, from microservices to monoliths, and is specifically designed to be able to work in constrained environments. It's really well known for its small footprint, so being able to go from small to large, um, fast startup times and fast ramp up times. Uh, it's also used by loads of Fortune 500 companies to be able to run their Java enterprises. So if you've not checked it out before, I would recommend having a look. As I said, it's open source. Go and check it out. Give it a try. There are some benefits. I'm not just going to tell you, yeah, it's great, and not have any proof. Like There is proof that it is useful. Um, we've got a blog here if you want to check it out on our Open Liberty site. This is where all of these graphics have come from. So you can take a look at the versioning in more detail to understand perhaps where it fits. Um, but essentially, here we compare it to the popular hotspot JVM. Um, OpenJ9 is the one in, I'm going to say green, but it's kind of like a weird teal color on this screen. So the one in green is OpenJ9. The one in orange is hotspot. Um, and as you can see, really what it gives us is that startup time can be up to 51% faster 
than Hotspot. Um, it has a 50% smaller footprint after startup, which means we have more resources for the application itself. Uh, we also get a uh, smaller footprint, especially after fully ramping up. So these can be really important metrics that we need to consider, and OpenJ9 can help with that. Now, I mentioned IBM summary runtimes. Um, this is the IBM OpenJDK runtimes that is powered by that Eclipse OpenJ9. Now, does anyone know why it might be called Semaru? I'm going to give you a really fun bit of trivia here. No? OK, so Semaru, not you, Emily. You work with me. <laughs> um, Semaru is actually the tallest mountain on the island of Java because we're in the clouds. Get it? Oh, I see a lot of rolly eyes. Yep. You're not going to forget that one, though. So IBM Semaru Runtimes, that's why we called it that. Um, and essentially, this basically gives you that sort of ability to be able to make use of the OpenJDK runtime and the Eclipse OpenJ9 JVM. We have different editions. So there is an open source edition of this if you did want to give it a try. Um, and I've put a link at the bottom uh, for Get Semaru. That's how you can go and give it a try if you want to. OK. So JIT server advantages for JVM clients. So let's go back to the JIT server. Now that I've introduced OpenJ9 and IBM Semaru runtimes, that's how you can use it. But let's go back to the basics of JIT server. Let's take a look at the advantages from the perspective of the JVM clients that will be utilizing this. So first one is provisioning. So for provisioning, because there are no more JIT compilation spikes, sizing becomes a lot easier for our microservices. There's no need to be able to have to add in these like just-in-case scenarios. You can just focus on what the application needs because you're handling the JIT stuff elsewhere in that separate microservice. As for performance, it will be much more predictable because the JIT is no longer stealing CPU cycles. And because the JIT can provide additional CPU cycles from the start, ramp up times will also be improved. This is especially true for short-lived applications since the majority of their lifespan is really during that startup. Um, the JIT server also has its own AOT cache, which means that any new replicated instances can have access to already compiled methods. So you don't have to waste time compiling those again. As for cost, well, less resources are needed. And more efficient auto-scaling also means that you should be paying less for what you need, just for what you need and use, not any more or any extra. And finally, for resiliency, um, the nice thing is the JVM and the JIT server are separate processes, like I said. So the JVM can continue even if the JIT server crashes because um, the JVM still has that local JIT that it can make use of. So that's a really great thing when it comes to ensuring resiliency and quality of service for our application. OK, so what does this actually mean when we start experimenting with it in real life? What performance benefits do we see? So we've got a bunch of different experiments that we ran here with some of the performance benefits just to give you an idea of the benefits and like actually seeing them in reality. So the first uh, one we did here is we're utilizing JIT server value, and we're looking at that value within Kubernetes. Uh, so this experiment was conducted on a Red Hat OpenShift cluster on AWS. It has three worker nodes, and it has around 12 gigabytes of RAM to play with. So in this, we ran four test applications just to show you that this is not limited to one particular runtime. This is all open source. So what we did here is we ran two versions of the Acme Air application, one as a monolith, and one is a microservice to also show you the difference with that. We also ran a Spring Boot Pet Clinic application and a Quarkus application, just to showcase that you, know, you can run lots of different applications on this. Um, and what we did is we applied real-world load to the applications to simulate activity, and we let the OpenShift scheduler determine how to deploy and replicate the applications. So this is essentially what it looked like when it came to how the OpenShift scheduler decided to place the various pods on the worker nodes. So each application has a different color, and each application is repeated, is replicated multiple times. So you can see here on the right-hand side, it's a little bit off color, so I apologize for that. But you can see which ones relate to um, which of those services I mentioned, the monolith, the microservice, the Spring Boot, and the Quarkus application. The size of the shape indicates its relative container size, and the number inside that shape indicates the memory limit for that container. So as you can see on the top row, this top row, we're using all three worker nodes. And the size of the containers are all larger than that bottom row here. This is because we're having to build in extra memory to be able to avoid those out of memory exceptions and improve throughput. This bottom line is where we introduce JIT server. So this results in us 
not even using the third worker node. We're only using two worker nodes this time, despite the fact that the JIT server containers, which you can see are the brown units here, it says J1200, which you can see there, um, despite the fact that they're the largest containers in the node, the savings actually come from being able to scale down all of our individual applications to be able to save and not have to use that third worker node. So it's actually about a 33% cost saving that we're making here by being able to pull out the JIT server compilations into their own microservice. So even though that JIT looks huge, everything else is a lot smaller and a lot more effective because it's able to share that JIT server. So that was one. Um, like taking a look at the same application, what we did is take a look at essentially their throughput to see how our applications were performing. Um, the orange line represents the top row from that previous page, and the blue line represents the bottom row. And they look the same. That's kind of the point. Um, the point is here that you, know, you can see that the performance is pretty even, despite the fact that the JIT server is working with less worker node CPUs. There's, there are some small blue like lag lines, um, and we think they might have been caused by the fact that we've got all our applications loading up at the same time, so a bit of noisy neighbor effect. But essentially, overall, they're pretty much the same in terms of performance, but we've got that cost saving. So that's one experiment we ran uh, where you can see that we were able to improve container density, reduce operational costs by up to 20 to 30%, and we still had that steady state of performance. So that was a great way to be able to showcase that. Another experiment we did was looking at how the JIT server affects auto-scaling in Kubernetes, because we remember that that's one of the important factors when it comes to enabling Java in the cloud. You can see a description of the test bed on the right-hand side. So this is kind of our setup that we had here. The autoscaler instantiates a new pod when the average CPU utilization exceeds over 50%. So we set that limit to 50% to be like, OK, this is when I want to be able to initiate that autoscaling. The graph shows that the throughput of the Acme Air app, while increasing amounts of load are applied. So you can see it as we're increasing in load. Uh, you can see increasing in time there as well. The orange line is the baseline, and the blue line represents using the JIT server. So as you can see, that throughput curve continues to rise, and then it plateaus. And the dips are associated with the launch of those new pods that we need, which do burn a lot of CPU. Comparing those two curves, JIT server gives you a better behavior, um, like in terms of new instances of the same app will have these methods available to them at startup. So essentially, you can see that blue line is consistently above the baseline throughout. So that's another way of showing you know, the ability to have better auto-scaling due to that faster ramp up when we're trying to ramp up um, auto-scaling of new pods, for example, when our CPU utilization gets too high. And we have less risk as well. OK, because everyone likes a live demo. I have pre-recorded this because it went wrong the other day. So it is a video, but I, you know, bear with me on this one. It's at least live so you can see the code as we run it. So in this application, just check the time. Yep, we've got time. So in this application, this is essentially the setup that we have. The purpose of this demo is really to show that in a constrained container environment, a JIT server does improve ramp up time, and it allows JVM containers to run with less memory, which is what we're trying to achieve here. So for this, we're using the Java EE Acme Air application running in the Open Liberty runtime. I should probably pause there and say, has anyone heard of Open Liberty? Only like one hand, thank you, sir. A couple of hands? OK, a few hands. Shy at the back, thank you very much. Um, Open Liberty, for anyone who's not come across it, is a cloud native runtime. Um, OK, here's a question Who's heard of WebSphere? Yeah, more hands, of course, of course. Um, so, WebSphere is sort of the legacy application server from IBM. Um, it was then sort of decided that really it's kind of a bit heavy and bulky for developers, difficult to use. So Liberty was created back in 2014, which is very much a modular um, built for the cloud runtime. And then that was open sourced in 2017 to be Open Liberty. So really, it is designed to be compatible with MicroProfile, Takar TE, Java EE, um, and a bunch of other different Java specifications and implementations that are open source. Uh, so if you want to check it out, we have a website and lots of different tutorials that you can use uh, to be able to try it. We're running this application using Open Liberty today. Um, so you might see some commands there that are specific to us. So that's Open Liberty. Check it out if you want to. Or come say hi on social media. I run the social media, and I'll say hi back. Um, cool. So for this, as I said, we're running it in Open Liberty. And Acme Air, for anyone who's not familiar with it, is sort of a simulation for an airline booking system. So we're running three instances here, which you can see in the middle blue box here. And what we've done is we've set different memory limits for them. 
So two of the containers, uh, the top two here, are not using the JIT server. They're just using your standard vanilla OpenJ9. One is limited to 400 megabytes of memory, and one is even more constrained to 200 megabytes of memory. This last Acme Air instance is the one that we're going to allow to utilize JIT server, but we're still going to constrain it to 200 megabytes, just to show that even in that constrained environment, that JIT server can provide a big advantage. Um, and they're all limited to one uh, CPU in order to simulate that constrained environment. Um, they're all connected to a single MongoDB database, which is going to just persist um, our data, essentially. Um, and then we also have JMeter, which you'll see on the left-hand side. This is what we're using to essentially apply load to our system to simulate what it would be like in reality. Um, we're also, we've also got things like Grafana. Uh, we're passing the JMeter information back to Influx, which is just another database. And that's being displayed uh, through Grafana graphs. And then on the right-hand side, we have Prometheus, which is connecting into our JIT server and collecting all that information and data from our JIT server. And that's then being also displayed in a separate dashboard in Grafana. So that's the basic setup. So let's take a look at the actual application itself. So in order to do this, we created some scripts to be able to make this demo a lot smoother and more efficient. But we will showcase the inside of those scripts during this, um, this video as well. Is this playing? Yes, perfect. OK, so the first thing we're going to do is start up our MongoDB database. So the container uh, in a minute will start. There we go. You'll see some messages on screen here. These are normal. That's just because we're pre-populating that MongoDB database with some initial data. So now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to start the JIT server container. So that's that separate container we were talking about, um, which we're using the start JIT server script we've got here. And then the next thing we're going to do is start Prometheus. Um, and that's going to scrape those performance metrics from the JIT server. Finally, once those have started, as you can see here, we're just doing the start Prometheus, we're going to start the three Acme Air instances uh, using our script again, just to make it easier. Perfect. Yep. And then we're going to go into that just to showcase what we're doing here. Essentially, we've got three Docker commands here, um, and they are to start each of the Acme Air instances. You can see that this, can you guys see that? I was just about to say, I looked up and I was like, oh, I can see it really well on here. Um, I'm really sorry. Uh, it should, I'll pause it. Um, I don't have it in a light format, but essentially, we have three Docker runs, and I'll be uploading my um, slides afterwards so you can show, see it there as well. I'm just thinking about whether it's worth, yeah, I'm just wondering about, can we switch the lights off or not? Can we switch the lights off on me? Yeah. Oh, it's all right. Ah, there we go. Can you see it a bit better? No. Don't worry. OK. We're going to skip it, and I'm just going to tell you what happens. So I've got some screenshots just to showcase. So basically, what we do is you've seen the application architecture. Once we get all of this up and running, what results is something like this. So this is the Grafana dashboard that we had in that application that we got up and running. I will post the video separately, so you can watch that in your own time if you'd like to. Um, but essentially, what we've got here, top left is our Acme Air application with 400 megabytes of memory, just vanilla OpenJ9. Top right is the 200 constrained, just vanilla OpenJ9. And the bottom left is where we have that JIT server. Now, what you can see the difference here, so if we start with this top right-hand one, what you can see is this throughput it starts pretty low and it stays pretty low because we're in a constrained environment. Whereas what you can see on the left-hand side is the throughput dramatically improves with that increased memory. But not only that, if you look at the bottom left, we've got a much faster startup and ramp up time utilizing that JIT server, even though we're using half the memory of that 400 one you see at the top. Um, so you can see vastly improved startup while still remaining very, very efficient in terms of our throughput. What we see when we look at the second grash dashboard we have, dashboard, I'm getting my words mixed up now, dashboard is this is essentially the performance metrics from the JIT server. What we're collecting here is the top left is the number of connected uh, clients. In this case, we're only connecting one Acme Air instance, so it's always going to be one. But you can collect that same data if you want to. On the right, you've got the CPU utilizations. So here you can see some of the spikes um, in terms of when that JIT, JIT compilation starts up. 
Um, but then you can see it goes straight back down again, pretty much to zero afterwards. Um, you can see that that spike correlates with the available memory dropping, because um, being able to compile also takes up memory as well as CPU. Um, and what you can see here is the number of compilation threads that it's utilizing. So you can see we kind of go up to sort of like three, and then up to four. We drop back down again. We go up to four. Um, there's a bit of a quirk with this implementation where it always shows one thread in use. We think that's just because it, it's always got one ready to go in case of compilation, um, but it doesn't mean that that's necessarily being used all the time. So that's just to explain these graphs. But you can see here that you can actually collect really important metrics from your JIT server and from your application to be able to understand those performance benefits and be able to see them in your actual application as well um, and understand how that's behaving. I'm sorry that the demo didn't show. I apologize for that. I will post it later. OK, so overall, I hope that through these experiments and what I've shown so far really shows that JIT server is kind of a natural fit for the cloud when it comes to deploying our applications. It performs better in a constrained environment. It uh, increases application density and reduces operational costs. It enables it to be containerized and, deployed and sort of managed by Kubernetes and, and cloud native managers. Um, and it enables us to have better cluster-wide CPU utilization and improved auto scaling. So everyone's on board, right? Totally, I've convinced you. So how do you use it? Um, so there's different ways that you can go about utilizing it. As I've said, go and check out OpenJ9 and Semaru if you want to go and have a go yourself. Um, there are different usage basics that you need to know, so I've included these in my slides. Um, if you're running from the command line, the JIT server can be started from the OpenJ9 bin directory, directory just by typing in JIT server. Uh, it's the second line down there, as you can see. Um, uh, as you, um, it's basically running an OpenJ9 JVM, but it's a different persona. Um, to use it in your app, you'll need to use the use JIT server um, and then your app, wherever that is. Uh, it is in my demo. Uh, so if you want to take a look at the video, we utilize this uh, client JVM uh, within one of our classes. So you can take a look at that. Um, and then there's a number of different options that you can specify, like the address and the port number, if you need more than just the default values. In my demo, we specify them, but we use the default values. We, we, we didn't have to specify them. We just did it to show you that you can. Um, so it might look a bit odd when you watch the video, but just bear that in mind. OK, cool. Um, and note that the JIT server and its clients need to be on the same Java version OpenJ9 release if you are going to use this. Using it in Kubernetes, you can set up a JIT server deployment and service using things like YAML files or Helm charts. There's also an operator that's now available. And if you want to check out how you can do that, we have a tutorial on IBM Developer made by my colleague Rich. So that takes you through the steps you'll need to be able to do that. I'll let you take a picture. Cool. Um, and then there's also the ability to be able to add encryption. So you can establish trust and encrypt the communication between the client and the server using TLS. This can be done with the different command options that are shown in blue at the top here, um, which specify the certificate file and the private key to be used. Uh, but you can also use things like Kubernetes secrets and map those into the containers using volumes. Uh, and then there's an excerpt here from a YAML file, which is just showcasing other ways to be able to do this. Um, if you want to find out more about this, we've got some resources that we can link you to. In terms of monitoring, I hopefully try to show you in my demo that you can add monitoring to be able to monitor how the JIT server is doing and the JVM. Um, there's lots of different metrics that you can query from the JIT server. This is a list of some of the ones that we used in the demo. So you can see here, like CPU utilization, available memory, connected clients, active threads. That was that Grafana dashboard that I showed earlier that you can also collect. You can also specify logging options as well if you're interested. OK, when to use this? Because like everything in tech, this is not a solution to everyone. Um, but it might be a solution you might want to consider. And this is when we'd suggest considering it. So when you need to use it. So if the JVM needs to compile many methods in a relatively short period of time, so those short-lived applications, for example, if the JVM is running in a CPU or memory constrained environment, which can worsen interference with, from the JIT compiler, um, you also need to make sure that your network latency between the JIT server and the client is relatively low, because that's a lot of communication to go back and forth. So bear that in mind if you are considering this. Um, you should only use, uh, and you should use any latency performance settings to tune your environment as well. Our recommendations are the JIT server does create additional resources. Obviously, we saw the container size in that previous experiment. So to get the most 
out of uh, most benefit out of this, you should try to have at least 10 to 20 connected client JVMs. Um, like we showed, we had many different applications running in those containers. Um, you need to have at least one to two gigabytes of RAM. If you're using it with Kubernetes, always set the CPU and memory limits, which is the max much larger than the requests, which is the minimum. This can really help when it's handling things like your CPU usage has spikes. As we saw with one of our experiments, it performs better if all of its clients are not started at the same time. We saw that noisy neighbor effect. So you know, if you can, try and avoid starting all your clients together. Um, and don't use encryption unless you really need it, because it does add overhead. If you need it, fair play. But if you don't, then maybe consider not using it, um, because as I said, a lot of overhead. Use things like session affinity to be able to make sure JIT servers and their clients stay connected. Uh, and the last tip is using the AOT cache. Uh, feature of OpenJ9, if both the client and the JIT server have this enabled, AOT code can be cached on the server side and then shared with all of the JVM instances, which can, again, really help with performance here. So that's just some usage recommendations, when to use it, and what to consider if you are going to use it. Final thoughts, promise. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, so JIT provides advantages, but it does give us uh, overheads when it comes to com compilation, whether that's CPU spikes, memory spikes, um, throughput. So hopefully what we learned today is that actually if we consider disaggregating the JIT from the JVM, it can provide us several benefits um, and be able to improve our applications to be sort of ready for the cloud when it comes to Java. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, check out uh, the OpenJ9 JIT server or SMRU cloud compiler um, because it provides all of these different advantages that you can make use of. As if I haven't given you enough homework already throughout this presentation, um, we always love more. So I provided a whole list of links that you go, can go and check out. Um, some of them I've already put in some of the slides, but this is just a one slide fits all approach to just give you all the links that might be helpful around sort of the performance benefits, how you can get started, that tutorial, and of course the documentation from the OpenJ9 website as well. So with that, I think I'm about time. Yep, perfect. So I'm going to say thank you so much for sticking with me. Hopefully, you'd enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, come see me after or contact me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Thanks very much. <laughs>